everyone. This is uh, the Nonviolence Report, Nonviolence News and Commentary. Uh, we're again experiencing unprecedented unanimity across uh, mainstream groups, uh, progressive counterculture, or whatever you want to call us, and uh, organizations like the American Sustainable Business Council, for example, and uh, Mediators Without Borders, or Mediators Beyond Borders, are all uh, focusing on the election crisis and trying to assure us that we do have a free and fair election. And today, here's what the mediators group has just said. With just two weeks remaining until election day, a broad coalition of advocacy and business groups, back on Tuesday last week, urged state election officials to publicly commit to a list of actions that would guarantee a free and fair election. Uh, we're also involved in an effort to have them go a little bit further and go on through the present electoral crisis season to see about necessary reforms so that this doesn't happen again. Uh, meanwhile, there's another hopeful trend. Uh, apparently, while you know us older generations tend to favor what's sometimes called nowism, focusing on the short term, it seems that uh, students and young people who are getting active are uh, much more focused on the long term and the future, which makes a lot of sense and is a very hopeful trend because, uh, as we know, real nonviolence tends to take the long term into account, and if you only take the short term into account, you end up reaching very often for a violent solution. This is one of the reasons why a constructive program is so important in nonviolence, because that builds for the future. So let me share two uh, events that are kind of contrasting and then go into our uh, regular list of resources. Uh, for one, uh, under the impressive title, Democracy Has Won. So it's one year after there was a right-wing coup in Bolivia in which Evo Morales, the very, very popular, uh, progressive, uh, indigenous-leaning president, was deposed and is now in uh, exile in Argentina by his own choice. But there was an election, and a socialist by the name of Luis Arque has won with a very substantial majority. And Morales writes from Bolivia, brothers and sisters, the will of the people has been asserted. I can't help making a comment here, which is maybe that Bolivia will show us the way. On the other hand, on somewhat more distressing news, you may have heard about the Kings Bay Plowshares. These are seven activists who uh, did a little bit of damage at a anti during an anti-nuclear protest at uh, the George at a Georgia naval base. And that was back in 2018. Well, they have now been sentenced uh, for rather lengthy terms. Fortunately, some of them have already been in prison for so long that the terms will probably be fulfilled when it's handed down. But in regard to one of them, Father Stephen Kelly, the judge made this interesting comment. Father Kelly, it has been clear to me you are sincere in your beliefs. However, I would be remiss to discount, to discount the nature of the offense that we're looking at today and the risk to safety that you knowingly undertook. <laughs> um, whose safety, I wonder, was really risked? But anyway, it does give us some insight into the way the legal system has to look at uh, events that we feel called upon to undertake in the nature of civil disobedience. Uh, this brings up, of course, the whole question of property destruction, which has always been sort of a borderline, a gray area for me. I think the missing element in property destruction is persuasion. If you destroy someone's property, first of all, you are kind of infringing on their rights. Second of all, you're putting it beyond them to choose. Now, to persuade people to renounce these things is the ideal way. That is persuasion rather than coercion. At the same time, we all know that sometimes you just don't have the time uh, 
to wait on such processes. So that leaves us with, uh, I guess, each case has to be judged on its own merits. So for resources, I want to highlight that the Nonviolent Peace Force is having a nonviolent cafe. They had the last one, uh, or will have one, in a couple of days on October 22nd. And they'll be discussing how to use nonviolence to create safe communities. And you can register for those nonviolence cafes on their site. I wonder what they serve at a nonviolence cafe. Uh, anyway, to get back to Mediators Beyond Borders again, they are doing a spiritual and inner peace building presentation Wednesday, November 10th at uh, 10 o'clock, excuse me, at noon Eastern time. Uh, they have launched something called the Trust Network to prevent violent conflict before, during, and after the U.S. 2020 elections. And they are pleased to announce that they're now offering basic and advanced training on early warning, early response, E-W-E-R. So that's another category of nonviolence trainings that's being offered uh, at a very much enhanced level now in this emergency. Uh, there will be a Kingian nonviolence mini workshop that uh, Kazu Haga, who has been on this program, will be offering on November 14th, and that can be looked up at the East Bay, East Point Peace Academy. East Point Peace Academy being the anti-matter to the West Point War Academy. <laughs> so uh, here's some interesting events. The federal government and the fossil fuel industry have announced that they're going to discontinue seismic blasting in the oceans. Seismic blasting is in a way parallel to the effect of uh, microwave radiation, the type that, that we use in cell phones and so forth, on, for example, bees. They are radically disoriented by uh, that kind of radiation, and it's, it's said that the, the fastest way to kill a beehive is just put a cell phone in it. So while we're doing that to the air, uh, in the ocean there's this blasting, which I gather is a, a geological technique to detect oil deposits, but it plays havoc on seagoing mammals, whales and dolphins, who depend on sonar to find out where they are and, and get their way around. So uh, uh, I'm sure we've all heard of the butterfly effect, you know, where a butterfly flaps its wings in one part of the world and change cascades out from that and it becomes cataclysmic in proportions. Well, here's another kind of butterfly effect, and I thank uh, Nonviolence Now for, or Nonviolence News, excuse me, for this report. And that is that a federal appeals court in Texas, San Antonio, to say something else about that town in a second, has ruled that the Trump administration's attempt to build a border wall through a South Texas butterfly sanctuary violates the property rights of the conservationists who run that sanctuary. Happy to say that also from San Antonio, two policemen They've done a film called uh, Joe and Ernie, Crisis Cops. I know about this film because it was screened along with mine at the United Nations Association Film Festival just this week. They've started a uh, mental health unit in the San Antonio police station and with a little bit of funding and a little bit of staff, they have saved many, many episodes from going down in a hail of bullets uh, by just talking to people. And, and it's just such a simple principle and so basic to nonviolence it is when we get one of these calls and describe what's going on, this person has a gun and the word gun leaps out. And we've had, as police people, 60 hours of training in how to use a gun and six hours of training in how to talk to people. So they are now in high demand because of the Black Lives Matter protests and the 
emphasis and focus attention to uh, policing. Uh, unfortunately, if going abroad now in uh, Thailand and Belarus, uh, the um, standoffs are still going on where the protesters refuse to stop and the government continues to repress. So in Thailand, for example, in Bangkok, protesters shut down the entire Bangkok transit system. And uh, recently, and, and this was after a chaotic night when riot police used water cannons on protesters, as have been used just recently in this country at the southern border, uh, people protesting for immigration rights. So the observation I want to make here is that attrition can be a serious problem for nonviolence movements, just as it can always be for labor movements, because we don't have the resources to give up our work, give up our school, and just go on with this. So the answer is to have a variety of techniques, and I sincerely hope, though I don't know exactly how to reach them, that we could get to these people with uh, the suggestion that they try something else, maybe dispersive instead of collective action and so forth. On the other hand, we have been talking for, to you from time to time about Sudan, and I'm happy to say that there's a good possibility now that Sudan will come off the terrorist list, which is critical for them, and it actually does seem to be happening today. Uh, they need to come up with some funding to pay for the past previous uh, actions that were carried out when they were still under the dictatorship. But with the critical thing that that country needed to rebuild was to come off that list so they could get back in communication and trade. And here in Turtle Island, uh, indigenous environmental networks have gotten a boost. A thousand activists hit the streets recently in Halifax, Navis uh, Nova Scotia, to show their support for uh, Micmac, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Micmac harvesters uh, in Nova Scotia. Uh, they launched a small fishery and it has been, you know, seriously uh, terrorized by uh, non-indigenous groups who are just afraid of the competition. But these activists turned out in support and we will see how that develops. I hope to tell you more about it in our next episode.